Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenda Cleasy. I'm the agronomy specialist with Stop. attendees are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenda Cleasy. I'm the agronomy specialist with SPG. With me today is Andrea Lauder, communications manager, also with SPG. Thank you very much for joining our final webinar in the 2017 Pulse webinar series. We look forward to returning to our webinars in the spring of 2018. So please check our website early in the year for a list of next year's webinar learning opportunities. As a reminder, CCA and CCSC credits are available for those who are attending the webinar today. To get your CCA credits for the webinar, you must be watching it live. Uh, for if you've attended the webinar, Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting your CCA number. If there is more than one person that is watching, you will need someone to verify those in attendance. And once verified, you can include all CCA numbers in one email. If you miss sending in your CCA number, you can always self-report. The webinar today will be recorded and will be posted to the SPG website for future viewing for those who are unable to attend or if you want to look back on the material that was covered. Recordings will be posted to the website under the communications tab. For today's webinar, throughout the time of the webinar, all participants will be on mute, but we will be happy to take any questions you might have uh, as you think of them throughout the webinar. If you want to ask a question, please type it into the question box located in the GoToWebinar dashboard on your screen. You can type and send in your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Our guest speaker today is Joey Vanasti and he is an operations supervisor for the Canadian Grains Commission uh, Saskatoon Service Centre. Joey has 23 years in the grain industry and has held various positions of responsibility with the Canadian Grain Commission since 2001. The Canadian Grain Commission works on the interests of grain producers. Guided by the Canada Grain Act, the Canadian Grain Commission works to establish and maintain standards of quality of Canadian grain, regulate grain handling in Canada, and ensure that grain is de a dependable commodity for domestic and export markets. So thanks for joining us today, Joey. I will now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you very much and, uh, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for taking the opportunity to attend uh, today's webinar. Um, the presentation that I'm going to uh, give in today's webinar is going to talk about our role uh, within the Canadian Grain Commission uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of representative sampling, how to obtain a representative sample, how to divide down, uh, reduce a sample. Uh, I'll talk about the determination of dockage. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to spend some time dealing with uh, grading and, and the assessment of a number of factors for for lentils, peas, and chickpeas. Um, there was some questions I know had come recently regarding soybeans. I have not reflected them in the PowerPoint, but I will try and speak to them and also to be able to answer any questions uh, that may be there. I'll also talk about the Harvest Sample Program, uh, a submitted sample service, and of course a dispute mechanism that is available to producers uh, when they are taking uh, or making deliveries to, to licensed plantary elevators. The photos in the presentation, um, the photos can, can vary uh, depending upon the difference in monitors and even more variants can be done when they're, uh, when they're printed uh, from a presentation like this. So I just use it with that the photos are for reference material only. Um, I've noticed when I've gone through the PowerPoints, a lot of the pictures look different than they do uh, when they are printed, but they are for reference material only today. The Canadian Grain Commission is a, is a federal government agency. We operate under the authority of the Canada Grain Act. Uh, we regulate the handling of 20 grains that are grown in Canada. Um, that includes barley, beans, buckwheat, canola, chickpeas, corn, fava beans, flaxseed, lentils, mixed grain, mustard seed, oats, peas, rapeseed, rye, safflower seed, soybeans, sunflower seed, triticale, and wheat. We certify the quality and safety and, and weight of Canadian grain delivered to domestic and export markets. The Canadian Grain Commission is an impartial third party, meaning we don't have a vested interest in the grain transaction. 
Our mandate is to work to establish and maintain standards of quality for Canadian grain, uh, regulate the grain handling in Canada, and to ensure that grain is a dependable commodity for both domestic and export markets. Our vision is to be a world-class science-based quality assurance provider. This is, a, this is a, an overview of our locations across Canada. Um, our headquarters is located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We have regional offices in Vancouver and in Montreal, along with a number of service centers located across Eastern and Western Canada. I am based right out of Saskatoon. Uh, we also have a service center in Wayland. Um, I like to share with people that at the end of the presentation, if their questions didn't get answered, or they think of something afterwards, uh, we're simply a phone call away, or you can come in and visit any one of our service centers. Representative sampling, why is it important? It is a very important piece. To ensure that samples adequately reflect the entire lot of grain, uh, we encourage that proper sampling procedures are used. The key to having a dependable and a representative sample is sampling often and thoroughly mixing and dividing down the selected sample. So for an example, if you're loading, unloading a truck, you want to ensure that you're sampling throughout the whole unloading process. If you were uh, unloading a semi, say a Super B with four hoppers, you'd want to ensure that you're sampling throughout the entire loading process. You don't want to just sample a portion of the load, that wouldn't be representative of the, of the load that you are delivering. You want to ensure that you're sampling it throughout the entire uh, unloading process. Once you've uh, obtained a representative sample, this is a piece of sampling uh, dividing equipment that we that is approved within the Canadian Grain Commission. This is called a Borner type divider. I'm going to explain uh, the process on the next slide of how you can do it uh, using four pails, but I'm going to explain the, the rationale or the, how this is used. So basically, uh, in the picture there, you will see at the top there is a hopper, and down at the bottom uh, there is two collection pads. What we use this for is we require a minimum of one kilogram of sample when we're when we're issuing a. Joey, it's Glenda. We uh, may have lost you. Are you on mute? Sorry for the, the folks on the line. We'll uh, make sure we get Joey back here right away. We're back. Oh, yeah. we're not. We'll be up and running soon. There. Do you see the Do you see the screen now? We're yes, ready we to do. go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll start back here. This is a Borner type divider with a hopper and collector pans at the bottom of it. What is it intended to do is to take the sample that you've taken and get it to a representative sample. So if we start with one kilogram of sample, uh, what's going to end up in each collection pan is going to be approximately 500 grams. We would take one of those 500 grams and put it back up top and that would give us approximately 250 grams. So what it's doing is it's splitting the sample in half each time. At the end of it, what we get is a smaller portion in, the, in one of the collection pans that is representative of the entire sample that we have taken. 
that's something that we use in uh, in one of our offices. And how can you use it um, using, or how can you do it using four pails? So here is an example in, uh, and I've numbered the photos. In sample, or in photo number one, this is the sample that you've taken. Uh, you mix the contents of, of pail A thoroughly with your hand. In number two, you place two empty pails labeled B side by side touching on a level surface. In photo number three, you pour the contents of the sample that you've taken at the point where the pails touch, ensuring that half the stream flows into each pail that is labeled B. In number four, you pour one pail of sample labeled B back into pail A. Uh, photo number five would be the excess. You pour the contents of the other pail uh, back into a, into a bin that, or a pail that could go back into your bin. On number six, you can repeat this process with the remaining sample until you have the amount that you need for your marketing purposes. And of course, in seven and eight is, is basically your final sample that you've had. So what you've done, you've taken the, the, the larger sample from number one that you've, that you've got, and you've got it down to a smaller portion in number eight that is representative of the sample that you have taken from unloading the truck. Canada's grain grades and standards are developed through scientific-based research, which is based off of end-use quality. Our grades reflect how grain meets the needs of end-use processors. Our grain is graded throughout the grain handling system according to official grades and standards or by contract specifications that are agreed upon between the buyer and the seller. The portion that I'm going to talk about for grading, um, we're going to look at um, lentils other than red. Uh, red lentils, uh, peas, we'll look at uh, bleached in them, chickpeas, and I'll also touch a little bit on soybeans. The information uh, that I share upon the grading comes from the official grain grading guide. It is a complete reference for the grading of grains, oil seeds, and pulses. So if you want to identify what is a grading factor, how is it determined, how much is assessed, what are the tolerances for it, what is the process to, uh, to do dockage. That is all contained in the official grain grading guide. In, in large, for all the 20 grains, it's 500 and some pages long. Uh, however, you can look at simply the chapter that you may be um, interested in, specifically for lentils, which may be 20 or 25 pages long. When we look to grade a sample, and in, in this photo here, it says consistency. Consistency to us is critical. We aim for that day after day, year after year. So how do we do that? Well, we have a standardized approach to how we grade a sample. On the left-hand side of the screen, you will see a flow chart, and that is something that we train our inspectors to do uh, so that their process is the same from each time they look at a sample. They're gonna start by obtaining that, that representative sample. And there's a number of processes, decisions, and obviously at the end, uh, the issuing of the appropriate certificate. This is how we can expect or train and expect our staff to grade a sample the same way each and every time. Um, it's valuable information to our clients. When we look to issue a certificate or to grade a sample, one of the first things that we do is we assess the sample for safety concerns. Some examples of stuff like that are treated seed, fertilizer pellets, extraneous materials such as glass or metal or wood, ergot or excreta, for examples. Prior to assigning a grain, we want to remove the dockage from the grain. Dockage is removed uh, by the cleaning procedures that are outlined in the official grain grading guide. I want to take some time and understand or explain the difference between dockage and foreign material because sometimes the two can get confused. So dockage is any material that must and can be separated from the parcel of grain so that the grain can be assigned a grade. 
So basically what that means is we have to remove the dockage before we can issue a grade to it. Foreign material, on the other hand, is material that remains in the sample after the removal of dockage. So for an example, in lentils, foreign material would include anything that is not a lentil or part of a lentil after the removal of dockage. Sometimes uh, producers or industry will ask us, do we remove the dockage before we grade the sample? Yes, the answer is yes. The dockage must be removed before a sample can be assigned a grade. So this is the determination of dockage for, for lentils that's taken uh, from the official grain grading guide. On the right hand side, there's a picture of a Carter dockage tester. And these would be the settings that we would use depending upon whether they were small seeded lentils or if they were large seeded lentils. Um, we would control, there's a feed control, there's an air control, the appropriate riddle that we would use and the appropriate sieve um, that we would use. We assess dockage to uh, 0.1 of a percent and since we're reporting the dockage we weigh the dockage material that is removed um, and not the clean sample we're simply weighing the dockage type material so the composition of dockage uh, for lentils the first bullet says material other than whole lentils that remain on top of the riddle whole sound lentils are returned to the sample so if there was any whole sound lentils that are removed in that process, we would take those out and we would return them back into the sample. They are not assessed as dockage. Um, material which passes through the selected round hole sieve, um, material that is removed by aspiration, that's a picture uh, of lightweight uh, material that would be removed through aspiration. And if needed, we could do some special cleaning for grade improvement um, if the grade can be improved. Lentils are designated into two classes, red and other than red. The method of determining the class is uh, by the seed coat color. Red lentils can also be confirmed by the cotyledon color. Lentil varieties uh, have a wide range of seed coat colors from green, red, speckled green, black, and tan. And the cotyledon colors may be red, yellow, or green. And here is a picture of the two of the uh, two classes, red and, of course, other than red, that we're going to pass into. Three factors that we're going to look at uh, for lentils other than red is ascaida, color, and peel, split, and broken, and the determination of how we go about uh, determining those. So for Ascaida, it is a fungal disease that attacks the, the lentil plant and the seed. It's any degree of white fungal growth on the seed is considered damage. The seed on the right hand side that I'm pointing to with my mouse is a sound seed. Uh, the other ones are assessed as Ascaida. Um, you can see the white fungal growth that is on the seeds and therefore we would assess those as Ascaida. Color is evaluated after the removal of stained and damaged lentils uh, using approved lentil color guides. It is important to remove the stained and the damaged lentils before color is assigned. For a number one Canada lentil that has um, good natural color, that is a requirement of that. The characteristics are lentils that are sound, well matured, and have a good natural color and so on and forth, so forth, for reasonably good natural color, fair color, and poor color. However, you may say to yourself, how is that determined? What is the standard that is used? It says lentils that are sound, well matured, and have a good natural color. Well, there is a tool that is used uh, in determining that color. The Canadian Grain Commission issues color guides uh, for all the colors. This is an example of how we would assess the color. So after we remove the stained and the damage from the lentils, we would have a sample of lentils and we would put beside it a color guide. The color guide is the standard. It reflects the lowest quality for that grain. So this, in this picture here, I believe this is a, uh, this is a good color 
color guide. So our inspectors are doing a visual assessment of the sample against the color guide in determining uh, what the color is. That creates the consistency when we have the print. It's everybody sees it the same way it is a standard and we can compare it against the sample itself. Peeled, split, and broken. We often get a number of questions around peeled, split, and broken. Uh, peeled, split, and broken includes lentils which are otherwise sound but which are less than three quarters or of whole seeds or where less than one half of the seed coat is intact. Lentils with cracked or clipped seed coats are considered sound when the cotyledons are held firmly together. Going to look at a, a couple of factors within for red lentils, uh, colored and wrinkled, and the determination of those. We looked at the color for other than red. Uh, now, when we look at it for red, we have the descriptor, good natural color, and then we have a percentage of copper. We also have total bleached, including copper, and adhered soil. So let's look at the first line good natural color, you're allowed 1% copper and 3% bleached, including copper, lights and mounts of adhered soil. This photo here is um, a print that is produced by the Canadian Grain Commission, and it is a red color guide. So working from the top, um, our first assessment is bleached. So working left to right, those would be seeds that we would consider to be bleached. Underneath that, those are seeds left to right that would be not bleached. Underneath that is the sound seeds, and of course, the copper seeds. This is a good example of photos um, that are used. It looks quite a bit different here on, on my monitor than it does in the printed. But once again, this is what creates the consistency. We have a red color guide um, when doing the assessment of what is considered bleached what is considered copper these this is the standard that we are comparing it against to make that determination wrinkled on red lentils is described as seed surface that has sharp ridges and pronounced depressions that could also be described as seed coat folds and indents wrinkles may be evident only on one side of the lentil lentils that only have dimpled seed coats or folds restricted only to the outside of ring of the seed are considered sound. So this is our red wrinkled guide and we'll focus on the middle part of it. At the top working left to right are not wrinkled. So those are pictures of seeds that we would consider to be not wrinkled. Of course there's two photos above that are uh, that are blown up to give a closer view um, the one on the left is an outside ring fold, and the one to the right is dimpled. Those would not be considered as wrinkled. Um, on the bottom, uh, those are seeds that we would consider to be wrinkled. And once again, there's two seeds that are, that are blown up uh, to show the folds and the indents. These are very valuable tools, and when producers are, are selling product um, and buyers are making that determination. These are tools that are available to them to ensure that there is a consistency in the application of the grading factors that is done. We're going to look at the uh, bleached and green peas. Uh, these are often questions that, that uh, arise. Bleach applies only to green peas. Uh, green peas are considered bleached if one eighth or more of the surface of the cotyledon is bleached to a distinct yellow color, which is in a marked contrast to its natural color. The two peas indicated are considered to be bleached peas. Those are the ones where the lines are, are showing on the picture. The pea in the center has an overall distinct yellow color, whereas the circle portion of the second pea indicates that more than one eighth of the pea is distinct yellow and therefore meets the definition. The balance of the peas in the picture are not bleached. These peas are not distinct yellow and in fact show a bleed of green throughout the yellow. It, it can be difficult to determine if a pea is bleached without removing enough of the seed coat. 
Um, so removing the seed coat over the entire bleached area allows comparison to its natural color. We'll look at classes, uh, green and mechanical damage, including splits within, uh, within chickpeas. There are two types of chickpeas, kabulis and dizzies. Uh, kabuli chickpeas are typically whitish to light tan in color. However, there are new varieties that are black or green in color. Uh, Desi chickpeas are typically brown in color and smaller than kabulis. In this picture, um, seeds on the left-hand side are kabulis. Um, they're a B90 variety in the center, and of course, desi chickpeas off to the right-hand side. Green is uh, is quite a bit diff different in the determination between kabulis and daisies. So for green in kabulis first, they're considered green if they show any green color of any size anywhere on the seed or the seed coats. So off to the right-hand side, you will see a sound kabuli. Um, beside it to the right-hand side is one that is shown as green. That would be assessed as green. For desi chickpeas, they're considered green if they show distinctly green color throughout the seed when cut to expose the cotyledons. So in this picture, the two seeds that are up at the top, they've been cut in half and it's showing you one half. The one on the left-hand side you can see is a distinct green throughout the seed that would be considered as green, whereas the seed off to the right-hand side has been cut. It has a good natural color in it that would not be assessed as a sound seed. Mechanical damage, including splits, how is that assessed? Well, it includes splits, um, whole chickpeas with more than 10% of the chickpea broken off, or of course, split chickpeas. Soybeans, there was a question that came up uh, and I didn't have an opportunity to just to uh, put it in the PowerPoint presentation. The question that was asked to me was, how do you assess damage in soybeans? So in the official grain grading guide, damaged soybeans includes, include those that are sprouted, frost damaged, shriveled, insect damaged, immature, or otherwise unsound. So a procedure, as we identify in the official grain grading guide, is soybeans showing some indication of possible internal damage or to be cut for confirmation of damage. So if we were making the assessment, we would cut the seeds in half, um, which is kind of similar to what I had showed there for the chickpeas, uh, to look at is there any internal damage um, that is possible inside of those. How do we support producer interest? I'm gonna speak about a couple of examples, uh, a couple of services that are available, one being the harvest sample program and also a submitted sample service. The harvest sample program is a free voluntary program. Each year we ask producers to send us crop samples available for a few months a year in the fall time. Producers will receive a free unofficial grade and quality information for their grain sample. We get thousands of samples each year from producers, eight to 10,000 probably per year for all of our grains. We use them to understand the quality of this year's crop as part of our harvest sample program. It's where we get our quality data from. Export customers rely on this data. This information is used to inform customers about Canadian grain, and we also use the samples are used in research. It's a free unofficial grade. It's We have lots of people that sign up for it. It's a great service. It, it provides us with, it, uh, with very valuable information, but it also provides information back to the producers themselves at no cost. This is a picture of the envelopes. If you are involved in the program already, that's great. Um, if you're not and you wish to sign up for it, um, you can visit the Canadian Grain Commission website. Our website is www.grainscanada.gc.ca and you can click on the Harvest Sample Program and from there you would sign up for your Harvest Sample Program kit. Also, we have sign-up forms that are available in our service center. In fact, if you come in and, uh, and you sign up through the service center, 
you actually get a, a sampling scoop, um, which are seem to be quite popular. So I, I really encourage it for, for producers. Submitted sample service uh, would be provided at any one of our service centers. Uh, we feel that if producers know as much as they can about their grain before they deliver, they can make um, informed decisions. You may be able to, uh, to negotiate for better payment. Producers can mail or bring samples of their grain to any one of our service centers for a fee. They will get a CGC certificate. Uh, it will indicate the grade, the dockage, the moisture, and or the protein. Our results, as I noted, they're impartial results. We do provide them on a, on a certificate, and that can be used uh, when marketing or negotiating fair value for your grade. It's your information. You don't have to share that. The grade and the, and the quality results, of course, they only apply to the submitted sample and not to the entire lot of the grain from which you take your sample. This is a service that's available year round. Uh, one of the things that our staff are, are very proud of is, is they can provide a face to face experience uh, with producers. It gives them an opportunity to ask questions about their, about their sample, the way it is grading, why are the reasons uh, that it is, gives us an opportunity to explain um, how we assess different grading factors, et cetera. So it's, it's really a, an opportunity to have that engagement for producers to learn about um, their sample of grain, and it also helps them uh, when they go to deliver their grain. The reason I encourage um, producers to either utilize the, the harvest sample program or the submitted sample program is it gives them an opportunity to learn uh, about the grade of their grain. So when they go to make deliveries uh, and there is a dispute, at least they've at least it will provide you with information uh, that you can use when you go to sell your grain. When you are making deliveries to licensed primary elevators and you do not agree with the grade, the dockage, the moisture, and the protein, um, it is a right for producers legislated under the Canada Grain Act that they can request that that sample be submitted to the CGC under what we refer to as subject to inspectors, grade, and dockage. The results of these are binding and it provides producers with an alternative. The minimum that we do request is 1,000 grams that is taken at the elevator. And this is, a, this is a document that's available on our website. And I'm just going to explain a little bit of information about uh, deliveries where you do not uh, agree with the grade, the dockage, the protein, or the moisture that is uh, given to you. It can either be yourself or the what? custom trucker. Um, who is making the delivery into the primary elevator, the time of disagreement would have to be at the time of delivery. So at that point of time, when, they, when you do make your delivery, you're provided with the grade, the dockage, the protein, or the moisture. And if you were to say, no, I disagree with that, then the elevator operator is required to issue an interim elevator receipt number with the with the assessment that they have done. The representative sample that's taken at delivery is sent to the nearest Canadian Grain Commission Service Center. We will inspect that sample, we'll determine the grade, the dockage, the protein, and or the moisture, and we will issue a certificate to both the producer and to the primary elevator company. The elevator operator will exchange your interim primary elevator receipt uh, for a primary elevator receipt cash uh, purchase ticket or check based off of the results in which we issue. Um, we, we invoice the company, they have the opportunity to either pay for it themselves or to pass those costs along to the producer. Often I, uh, I get phone calls from producers uh, on disputes um, that happen after the fact. And if there's, uh, if there's some good advice that I can share, it's, I encourage producers to speak with their elevator prior to delivery. 
there's usually ongoing dialogue around uh, deliveries being made and the time frame around them. That's an opportunity, great opportunity to identify what the grade and the dockage you are expecting. It's in a non-confrontational way. For an example, I'm sending a Super B of, of wheat on next Tuesday. Um, I am expecting that it will grade a number one CW red spring, or it's going to be a number one Canada lentils with 2% of dockage. And it's also an opportunity to share that if the results aren't what you're expecting, then you want to use the dispute mechanism under subject to inspector's grade and dockage. It is your right. Custom truckers can act on behalf of a producer. Um, so you can share that information with your custom trucker if, it, if your grain is being delivered that way. I like to use an example when I, when I am speaking to, to people, but I take the grain out of it and I, I simply use dollar amounts. If you had a truckload of grain, um, but in this case we're not going to use grain, we're going to use $100 bills. And if we put $15,000 um, of $100 bills into that truck and you were delivering it to three different banks. If you went to bank A and they were going to give you $17,000 for that money, imagine you'd probably jump all over top of that and say, great, I've got great money for, for this. If you went to a different bank and they said it's worth $15,000, all right, you're being given a fair deal. However, if you went to a different bank and they said, is $13,000, I would suspect that most people would ask why. And it's no different in terms of grain. Producers own the grain. They're entitled to be paired, paid fairly for it. And in the, in the, where there is a dispute, you can use the Canadian Grain Commission uh, for us to be able to provide information to both you and to the, the elevator company. There are a number of uh, resources available on our website. It's a wealth of information. Perhaps you're looking for moisture charts, you're looking for test weight charts, things from the official grain grading guide, um, where the office is located. Um, it is a great resource. Um, as I said, there's also the Saskatoon Service Center. Our staff would be happy to, uh, to help anybody. Um, and there is my personal email and, and my direct line for anybody to give me a call. Uh, there's, you can ask questions. I'd be glad to help anybody. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. And uh, I look forward to taking any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Joey. We appreciate all of the information that you were able to share today and also appreciate you sharing you know information where people can go to find out more or contact you if they have additional questions uh, we do have a few questions that have come in uh, through the webinar so as a reminder we are now going to open everything up on the webinar for questions please type your questions into the question box on the go to webinar dashboard and we will uh, moderate the questions from this and with joey uh, just as a heads up, Joey, we did email you a question that came in to us via email with a photo. If you have time, after we go through some of the other questions, if you want to open that up and have a look, if you want to share it um, with the group, that's fine. Um, otherwise, if you want to reply back, that would be great too. Um, one of the questions that did uh, come in here is when grading for um, for color or for ascochyta and wrinkling color ascochyta and wrinkling do you only assess the sides of the seeds that are facing you or do you flip the seeds over or move them around to assess different sides very good question uh, for the assessment of of any of the factors we would look at the entire seed um, so often that involves moving kernels around with our fingers uh, to look at, at, at simply all the sides, the whole surface area of the kernels. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question that has come in is maybe, it's kind of a question, maybe a concern, maybe you could address it a little 
further is that the standards for color, I believe you mentioned are, are based on kind of a color guide or chart, um, yeah. but it seems to be a bit arbitrary, perhaps depending on who's looking at it or how they view those colors. Can you maybe expand a little bit more on, you know, are they arbitrary or do you find them to be relatively consistent? It, that's that's another great question. Uh, the color guides are are there as the standard. Um, however, there is there is training uh, that we provide to our inspectors of the determination in which they do that. Um, I can only speak to the training that we give to our staff and in, in the interaction we have on a regular basis. Um, lighting is is also a critical part to have the correct lighting to look at the samples underneath, both from the photo and from the sample itself. You want to ensure that you have uh, the proper brightness and the proper color. Um, we do actually use light meters within all of our offices to make sure that our specifications are standard across Canada um, and that our light bulbs um, are not outside of specification. So to, to the question, it's, uh, it's hard to answer. Um, I, I can tell you that those are things that we look at in terms of training, uh, the equipment that we use, uh, and it is a visual comparison against the sample versus the color photo. Okay, thank you. Do you have any maybe recommendations if, if producers are, you know, looking at, or I know you talked a lot about if they disagree, are there suggestions to maybe, you know, what type of lighting that it should be looking looked at under if they're at their elevator and have a question about well, that? Well, I, th I think that's I think that's an opportunity where uh, where a producer could come to one of our service centers and uh, and we could spend some time and uh, and show them the specifications of our lights. Um, if if I was a producer making a delivery and uh, somebody was doing a color assessment. One of the first things that I would ask is what is the tool that you're using it against to ensure that the, uh, that they are using the color guides because um, that is the standard. Um, we can all have a, a picture in our mind of what reasonably good or good natural color is um, and that can create some differences if we don't have the tool to compare it against. So um, one, of the, one of the key things would be using that tool in their assessment when they're making their deliveries. Okay, thank you. Another question um, is from a trader who has a problem with uh, customers in green number two lentils, especially in the Middle East. It says number two is too wide and um, sometimes they don't feel like they get the, the best side of the stick, I guess, in number two deals. Do you have any plan or does the Grain Commission have any plan to divide number two lentils into subclasses which could make them more clear? I am not aware of any changes uh, being made to a number two Canada lentil. Um, however, there is a pulse subcommittee um, where those questions could be taken to. Um, pulse subcommittees um, meet on a regular basis and that's where uh, recommendations for any kinds of, of uh, changes would come. Um, if somebody wanted to, uh, they could definitely give me a call afterwards and I would be glad to put them in contact with, uh, with uh, a member of the subcommittee. Great. Thank you, Joey. Another, I guess, follow-up question. What is the proper color or type of bulb for grading purposes? Well, there isn't uh, there isn't a standardized uh, bulb um, because there can be there can be fluorescent bulbs. There can also be LED lighting. Um, there is parameters for the color, and there is parameters for uh, the brightness. Um, that there isn't per se one bulb or two bulbs that are used. It's actually the uh, the parameters that the bulb exhib exhibits. Do you, can they find that information on those color parameters somewhere, or do you have it? I don't know. I I don't have it right in front of me. Um, I would what I would suggest for the person that is answering or asking the question, 
uh, to contact me and I will get that information of what the color and what the brightness has to be so that they can uh, so that they can work with a manufacturer they're able to provide them with those specifications and then they can get they can provide them with the lights well, thank you um, how do you grade faba bean for black spots it is said that for Canada grade number one the damage should be less than four percent so does it mean that you take a hundred seeds for the assessment or what do you look at to get to that uh, four percent for black spots in fava beans okay so uh, when I look at fava beans blackened in the official grain grading guide um, fava beans are blackened when their seed coats a very dark blue to black um, when I look at the representative portion for grading um, for blackened uh, in a situation uh, it says see damage for it so damage the minimum amount that you would want to assess would be 100 grams the maximum would be 250 grams so that would be the assessment that we would split down the sample if we were using a one kilogram sample we would go down to a smaller sample um, we don't we wouldn't have to pick the entire uh, one kilogram However, that also depends on if it's a low, very low percentage, um, that's where the minimum and the maximum come in. So for damage, you're going to pick between 100 and 250 grams. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there has been some questions, and I, maybe you can address this as a two-part. So I know there have been questions coming in in regards to green seed in soybean, and maybe one, if you could address how green seed in soybean is assessed. Uh, some may come off green and change color, you know, in the bin or under aeration. And um, how do you how do you truly know if they're if they're green or immature seed? And then two, there is people are hearing that there is some variation in that in the grading with regards to green seed. And if you could address just that the standard that's used to assess green soybean seed. Okay, um, I'm going to pull up a picture uh, on the screen. Uh, I had just looked at this beforehand, and do you the, do you see that on your on your um, desktop now? Yes. It is a picture of soybeans. So at, at the top uh, where the green seed has or the seed has been cut open, you can see that it is immature. Um, it is. Um, Whereas the seeds on the bottom, on the right-hand side, uh, that would be a sound seed. The seed to the left-hand side, um, that is not immature. There is some green that is coming from the outside, but in the center of the seed, there's still lots of yellow in that. So we would not consider that to be immature. Okay, thank you. And um, just in general, based on you know any samples you may have seen from 2017 in pulse crops, are there any concerns that uh, have noted or common trends in anything that you've found in in those pulse seeds coming in in 2017? No, the the uh, the quality of the crop. Uh, for this year has been has been quite good uh, for the samples that we have seen. Um, you know, we had a, a fairly good run of, of harvest weather. I think overall, from a quality standpoint, um, for lentils, um, they're very good this year. Um, sometimes, uh, some samples we have seen the difference between good natural color and, and reasonably good natural color, uh, difference between a number one and a number two, but overall I would say that there's uh, very good quality in terms of the lentil crop. Great. Thank you so much, Joy. That is all of the questions that we have uh, in for right now. For right now. So we uh, will just send out a rem or say a reminder for those who are looking for CCA and CCSC credits uh, to respond to Andrea's email to send in your number so that we can get those in or you can always self-report. Again, a reminder that the webinar was recorded and it will be posted to the website if you want to go back and listen to anything again. Also, if you have any suggestions, 
if you want to respond to the email that Andrea sends out with some ideas for our 2018 webinar series, that would be much appreciated. Uh, thank you so much, Joy, for speaking to us today on Grading Pulses. As well, thank you to Andrea for organizing the session today. And a very big thank you to all of the participants for joining us today and that have joined us throughout 2017 webinar series. Please remember to keep your eyes open for the 2018 topics coming next year. If you have any further questions, again, you can go back to the presentation under the communications tab on the website and you will find Joey's contact information as well as the website information so you can pose any uh, further questions to Joey. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone.